1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 1. Let us listen to God's word. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the age has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, my dear friends, free from idolatry, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Amen. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank Frank for the opportunity to come and speak to you for the next couple of evenings about some of these reformers and the things that they've got to teach to us. These are not going to be lectures. What we're really hoping will happen these evenings is that we'll come alongside one of these figures from the past and try to get to know them a little bit and then ask them, where would you point us to in the Bible that we should consider in order to really understand one of the things that was close to your heart and of great importance to you? And so that's why I wanted us to turn this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 especially on an evening when we're preparing to come to the Lord's table. And let's bow together and ask the Lord to help us. Father, we want to praise you this evening because you are the Lord of history. And we praise you for the church of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for those times and periods of real revival and reformation that you have brought to the church of your son in the past, Lord, we know that we need revival and reform like that in our day. So please speak to us from your word and really challenge us. And as a result, may our lives be reformed and may our church be reformed and revived. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, when John Calvin lay on his deathbed, 
he had the opportunity to think back and to reminisce about the time when he arrived in Geneva in the summer of 1536. He had come there as a young academic. He was 27 years old. He hadn't actually planned to visit Geneva. There was political turmoil in the region, and it forced him to change his travel plans. And about a year beforehand, the Reformation had come to Geneva, but largely only for political reasons. The whole city had become Protestant. Their priests had left. The mass had been abolished. They removed all crucifixes and images from their church buildings, and they minted new coins with the city's slogan. They said in them, post tenebras lux, after darkness, light. And as Calvin lay ill and approaching death, he looked back in that time and said, when I arrived, actually no reformation had taken place. Listen to just a couple of sentences of Calvin's own words. When I first arrived in this city, there was almost nothing. They were preaching, and that's all. They were good at seeking out idols and burning them, but there was no reformation. Everything was in turmoil. We all know about that, don't we? It's really easy to tear things down. It's another thing altogether to be able to build something up and really set it right. And that is what Calvin set his heart upon as he came to Geneva. His own personal motto captured it so well. Calvin said, my life is about offering my heart to God promptly and sincerely. A few months later, in the following January, he proposed a set of measures to reform the church in Geneva. And one of the key components that he presented was a reformation of the Lord's Supper. Calvin wanted to take the supper and to reform it. He wanted the supper to be administered in a way which was profoundly shaped by the Word of God. And also in his mind, he wanted it to be done in a way which was like how the early church kept the Lord's Supper. So some of the things that meant was no longer would the supper be thought of as an offering made to God. Instead, the whole understanding of the supper would be turned on its head, not a sacrifice represented to God, but instead the Lord's Supper was a precious gift that God gives to his people. And all his desires for reform got him into real difficulty. Let me give you some of the little things that actually caused a lot of trouble. He wanted to use normal, regular bread. Not the wafer, not even unleavened bread. He wanted to use normal, good bread bread. And the authorities didn't like this. At this time, they were taking their lead from what the city of Bern was doing. And in Bern, they used unleavened bread. And so, the authorities said, you've got to use that bread as well. It led to something of a standoff. And eventually, Calvin had to leave Geneva because of the situation that came about from that decision. He hadn't even been there for two years, and it seemed that all the efforts that he had gone to to reform and revive the church had come to nothing at all. Well, he ended up in Strasbourg, and to cut a very long story short, eventually the circumstances in Geneva changed, and the people in the city begged Calvin to come back and minister to them. And in 1541, rather reluctantly, he returned there. And that was with good reason. Calvin would have to slog it out for the next 15 years to really see the church in Geneva changed and brought into a biblical pattern. And all through that time, the issue of the Lord's Supper 
and how it's understood and how it was practiced, it remained a very important and hugely controversial issue. A few more of the reasons why it was so difficult. Calvin thought that it was really important that people came to the table frequently. And the city authorities in Geneva thought that that was just too much too soon for the people. Let me explain why. Before the Reformation, the mass was going on all the time. You could go to church and there might be multiple masses happening almost simultaneously. But even though the mass was happening frequently, people actually came to commune very infrequently. Most people came once a year at Easter time. And so when Calvin said, we should come to the Lord's table every time we meet together for worship, people said, that is just too much change too quickly. It was another live issue though. And it was all about who got to decide who could come to the table and who couldn't come to the table. And for Calvin, he wanted the elders of the church to be able to make that decision. But the city council thought, that's our decision. The last thing that they would ever do would be to have a French refugee come and tell them as people who had only recently found their independence how they would rule their city. And it wouldn't be until 1555 that the church got to decide for itself through its elders who was a communicant member and who wasn't a communicant member. So through this time, the Lord's Supper, our whole understanding of this sacrament, of this spiritual meal, it was a very controversial issue. A few years into Calvin's time in Geneva, some of his colleagues asked him to write to the most powerful man alive at the time, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, to explain to him just what was the Reformation about. It was turning Europe upside down. It was leading to so much difficulty. And Calvin's friend said, write something to explain to people just what we want in reform and what the basis for it is. And so Calvin responded with a work published in 1543, and it was called the necessity of reforming the church. And it was a book that really was one of Calvin's greatest accomplishments. It went through eight editions in the 50 years that followed. And in it, Calvin argued that all the controversies that had been causing so much strife and ch trouble in Europe really boiled down to simply two issues, two fundamental issues. Now, one of them won't really surprise you that much. What's the Reformation about? Calvin said the Reformation is all about the doctrine of the gospel. In particular, how is it that a sinner receives the grace of God in Jesus Christ? And in this book, Calvin spent over half of it, you won't be surprised, talking about that great Reformation truth of justification by faith alone. Calvin said, that truth, it is the hinge. Everything in the Christian life, it turns on this hinge of being put right with God on the basis of the righteousness of Christ that we receive by faith alone. So that was the hinge, really important. But for Calvin, it was not the most pressing issue behind the Reformation. It wasn't the thing that he thought required urgent attention. His word was that it wasn't the soul of the matter. The very heart of things for Calvin, it lay elsewhere. He said the great priority for the church was to have its worship reformed, brought into line with what the Bible teaches, and brought into harmony with the way that the early church worshiped. And so given the fact that that was so important to Calvin, what I wanna do is turn this evening to 1 Corinthians 10 and to a passage 
that really mattered to Calvin when he thought about the supper and all that it meant. It's a passage that really informed the whole way that he thought that we should understand the Lord's table and coming to it. When it comes to understanding communion, it in many ways involves walking quite a fine line because it's one of those things where we can easily go into error on either side. Some of you might be heading off to the Lake District this summer, and you might know Helvellyn, the third highest peak in England, stands at 3,000 feet above sea level. And one of the most popular and demanding routes to the summit is via Striding Edge. If you've ever been there, it is a tight rope of a walk along this razor back ridge. It's narrow, it's exposed, and there are great drops into danger on either side of it. And Paul, I think, almost has that sort of idea of walking a narrow mind in line when he writes 1 Corinthians chapter 10, because he says to the Corinthians something that Calvin would completely have agreed with. When it comes to the Lord's Supper, you can go wrong by both overestimating its importance and underestimating its importance. We have to walk this fine line. Well, this whole discussion in chapter 10 happens in the context of idolatry. In Corinth, most of the meat that was butchered in the city was slaughtered in butchers that were beside pagan temples. And a really important part of society at the time involved attending the ceremonies that were held in those temples. If you wanted to get ahead in advance, you had to be there, whether it was a sporting society you were part of, a philosophical society, a cultural group. Very often, their activities would revolve around going to one of the temples to, meet, to eat the meat that had been sacrificed in the name of the false gods. We got a real taste for this just last weekend. We had been out visiting some Presbyterian missionaries, the Dixons in Jordan. I had been teaching at the theological seminary there for the week. And on the Saturday afterwards, we got to visit Jeresh, which is one of the best preserved Roman cities anywhere outside Rome itself. And in Jeresh, right beside one of the temples, you can go and visit the ruins of a butcher shop. They've got the slab of um, stone that the butcher would have used there, and it even has the knife marks in it. Meat would have been sacrificed there in the name of these false gods, and it would have been regular for people to come and eat it together when they went to religious ceremonies. And in Corinth, some of the Christians thought all of this is harmless enough. These idols, they don't actually exist. They are simply false gods. And so it's fine to go along and to eat the meat that's been sacrificed to idols. But in verse 14, Paul says, do not even think of doing that. Instead, run away from it, flee from idolatry, run from it as quickly as you can, don't be involved in it. People said, we'll be fine. We know what we're doing. We'll be okay in all of this. And Paul said, please be careful. Don't presume that your feet are secure. Verse 12, don't think that you would never end up in the situation where you could fall. In the Christian life, there are clear and present dangers along the path of discipleship. Professing Christians, they can fall and stumble to their spiritual death. And Paul gives us here a glimpse into at least one of the reasons why people thought I'll be fine. I can go and eat. I know these gods 
don't exist at all. One of the reasons why people thought it was okay, one of the reasons why they presumed was that they overemphasized, they overestimated what the Lord's Supper gave to them. They thought, we come to the Lord's table. We have all the privileges that go with that. We will be fine. Nothing will happen to us. And Paul says, please learn the lessons of history. Remember the privileges, Paul says, that the Israelites had in the Old Testament. They had been delivered out of Egypt in the most miraculous and striking way. Moses was leading them through to the promised land. They had come through the waters of the Red Sea, piled up on either side, and they had drank miraculously in the desert. Notice the way that Paul describes it in verse 2. He said that their journey through the sea, through those waters, it was like their baptism. And then in verses 3 and 4, he says the way that they ate and drank in the wilderness, that was their spiritual food and drink. It was bread from heaven and water from the rock, and all of that pointed to Christ. And yet these people who had been in their way baptized, those people who had been fed with spiritual food, they perished. Many of them perished. They died in the wilderness. And so Paul says, learn this lesson in verse 12. Don't think that because you come to the Lord's table, you're okay. Don't think that simply because you have been baptized, all is well. He said, these people, they were baptized, they were fed spiritually, and yet they perished. So verse 12, if you think that you're standing firm, take very careful watch in case you fall. There's nothing automatic about the Lord's table. Coming to the Lord's table is not like booking your seat in a plane. There's nothing mechanical or automatic about it. Don't overestimate the significance of coming to the Lord's table. Listen to the way that Calvin put it, because this was something that was very close to his heart. He said, the bread and wine, they must be received in faith. If you come to the Lord's table without faith, Calvin said, your heart is like a cold, hard stone. And the water of divine grace, it might fall from heaven onto your heart, but it will be cold, it will be impenetrable, and the grace will not reach within. Don't overestimate the Lord's Supper. Don't think that simply coming to this table will mean that all is safe and well. This is a table that we must come to with ongoing, believing, and obedient faith. So that's one of the dangers. There's another one. And this time, it comes from underestimating the significance of the Lord's Supper. Remember the presenting issue here. Is it okay to go with your colleagues to eat the food which has been sacrificed down beside the temple? And Paul says, you need to realize just how significant any meal is that takes place in a religious context. It is never simply food. You can't think of it just as a meal. When we eat in any religious context, it is an occasion of profound spiritual significance. Someone in the Corinthian church pipes up and they say, come on, Paul, idols, they are not real. They aren't gods at all. There is no Aphrodite or Zeus. These so-called gods, they don't even exist in the first place. And in verse 21, Paul says, yes, you're right in that, but don't be naive. There are real evil powers involved in false worship. Demonic powers use false religions to control people. 
religious meals, they are always very significant. So if this table really is significant, if it's something that we're actually in danger of underestimating, how should we understand it? How should we make sense of the significance of this table that's spread before us? Well, let's start with the wine in verse 16. Paul calls it the cup of thanksgiving or the cup of blessing. Isn't that such a precious name to describe it? All of us, by nature, we deserve nothing but the cup of God's wrath. Jesus drained it for his own. And so instead, what are we given? We are given a cup of thanksgiving, a cup of blessing. You know that for centuries before the Reformation, the cup had been, they called it, reserved for the priests. The people didn't get to drink the cup. And one of the great things that came about with the Reformation was that the cup the cup of thanksgiving, the cup of blessing, it was put back on the lips of God's people. But there's more. Still in verse 16, Paul says the cup of blessing, and Calvin loved this idea, is a participation, a communion, a sharing in the blood of Christ. That cup, when we drink it in faith, it is a communion, a participation, a sharing in the body of Christ. And this communion that's been described is, first of all, a vertical communion. It is a participation in Christ. When we come to this table in faith, we commune with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you say, How does that actually happen? What does it mean for us to come in faith and to commune with Jesus Christ? And the simple answer is that, first of all, it is a mystery. It's much easier to tell you what it doesn't mean than to tell you exactly how it works. We can tell you this. It's not at all because the bread and the cup somehow change to become the body and blood of Jesus. Jesus is right now in his body with real humanity at the Father's right hand. And his human nature wouldn't be the sort of human nature that he has if his human nature was able to be present in the bread and in the wine. But Christ He's not distant when we meet together. He's here by His Spirit, and the Spirit lifts us up into Christ's presence so that when we come in faith, we commune with Jesus Himself. This communion takes place because the supper is a sign and seal that God's Word is really offered to us. It's a sign of the gospel itself. It's a sign that God puts into our very hands this evening. It's a sign of our gracious acceptance. It's a sign of his fatherly provision that you can pick up the bread and then raise the cup to your lips. So it's a sign. And we're familiar with the idea of a sign But I think often the only way that we think about the sign is the fact that the table is here and it's like a signpost to call us to turn our minds back 2,000 years and to try to think hard and meditate very deeply on the cross and its significance. And we ought to do that. But the Lord's table is also a sign at a deeper and more profound level. This is a sign that seals things. This is a sign that seals to us our union with Christ when we come to the table in faith. Now, let me try to illustrate that because I know that can be hard to get our heads around. What do seals do? Well, we're familiar with them in all sorts of important documents. 
It's a seal that's put there to say, this is genuine and this is authentic. University exams going on at the moment, and for those in their final year, soon they will be awaiting their graduation, and they'll go and they'll get their certificate, and we all know that certificates like that, they have the seal affixed onto them. It says, this is genuine, and this is legitimate. Or maybe later in the summer, you might be flying off on your holidays, and if you look at our passports now, they're covered with all sorts of of seals upon them, things that are hard to um, counterfeit, that say, this is a real, authentic passport. This counts. This will work. This will be effective. Perhaps the kind of sign that seals, though, that we're most familiar with, we might see again this summer, if we go along to a wedding and see the wedding ring, because that is another sign that seals something. It's another sign that says, this is authentic. We're familiar with it at weddings. The rings are exchanged. The presence of a ring, it doesn't make the marriage any more legal. But if you ever see someone who's lost their wedding ring, you'll know that the ring is worth far more than simply the monetary value contained within it. It's precious because it is a sign that seals something. And so, at the Lord's table, in this sacrament, we are given visible signs and seals that authenticate our union with Christ. When the elements are distributed to us, and when we participate in faith, there is an eating taking place that isn't happening with our mouths, and there is a drinking that is taking place which is spiritual. As surely as we taste the bread and the wine, so when we come by faith, God is feeding our souls spiritually. He is giving us communion with His Son. It's not as if We lose our union with Christ before this, and only when we come to the table is our union restored. No, it's that our communion with Christ, when we come in faith, this table, it signs and seals to us. It says, if you come here believing in the gospel, you can be absolutely certain, you can be assured, you can be supremely confident that everything that you've heard in the gospel, it is true and it belongs to you. In the supper, it's as if we pick up the gospel in our hands and we say, God has given us this as his gift. He's given it to us to nourish our souls. And when we eat and drink with faith, well, then we are nourished and we are fed. So, with the supper, don't overestimate its importance. Don't think that simply because you've come to the Lord's table, everything will be fine. Paul says, if this evening you think you're standing, be very, very careful in case you actually fall. But at the same time, don't go off into another error and think, what happens here is just some ritual that we go through. Don't even think that this Lord's table is simply a really graphic way to help us to remember the cross of Jesus Christ. Know that this table is a sign that seals. When we come in faith, we can be very confident. We can be supremely assured that all the promises of the gospel belong to us. Just as surely as you've eaten your little piece of bread and drunk the little sip of wine, as surely as you've eaten those things. So, if you come by faith, your soul will be nourished and you will have communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. The supper is that powerful. It is a great privilege That's why we call it our communion.
communion with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great gift to the church. It is a huge privilege for us. And that's why Calvin said, if we're going to reform the church, we need to make sure that we reform our worship and we put the Lord's table back to its proper place, right at the center of the worship of the people of God. This is not an offering that we make to God. This is an offering that he puts into our hands. It doesn't take place on an altar. Instead, it takes place on a table because this is not the place of a sacrifice. This is the place where the risen Lord Jesus Christ brings his people together around his table in order to feed them and in order to nourish their very souls. Let us pray. Father, please would you forgive our sins when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Father, we confess to you the times when we have overestimated its importance and we have presumed that because we've come, all will be well. Father, please, would you humble us and would you cause our faith to grow? And Father, please also have mercy upon us for when we've missed the full significance of this table that's spread before us. Lord, even tonight, open up our eyes and enable us to see this table for what it is. And as a result, may we leave here this evening with our hearts warmed and with our souls nourished. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.